Good day and a warm welcome to this second Boost interview of a series in which we interview people who are experts in the mobility, in urban mobility. And this time we have as a guest Erik van Eindhoven. My name is Ru van Beuren and it's a pleasure to host this very interview. And we also have some people in the live stream and they have the opportunity to interact with us here within the studio, Erik. Uh, first and foremost, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, yeah. extremely busy, I'm mm -hmm. say, but um, feeling great. Thank you. Welcome to Eindhoven, Mr. Eindhoven. Yeah, thank you. This yeah. Thing, you're not first. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry for <laughs> making such a boring joke. But yeah. um, So you are involved with Transer. You're one of the directors as being the COO, Chief yeah. Operating Officer. But first and foremost, what is Transer about? No. As you said, Transer is active in mobility. We are a fintech uh, company uh, and what we do, we are a B2B2C ticketing platform for mobility. A B2B2C. Yes, so we deliver to the B and they deliver to the C mm -hmm. um, uh, in the field of mobility. And what we do, we aggregate uh, tickets of public transport operators. We combine that with micro mobility and we provide those tickets via one API, one key, to other platforms with large use bases. So that means, for example, we deliver our tickets to a large planner. Here in the Netherlands, for example, 9292 is a very famous uh, public transport planner. They used to do only planning, but now they can plan, book, and deliver tickets to their clients who can travel that. And that's what we facilitate. We don't do that only here in the Netherlands, but also in Belgium, Germany, France, Italy, uh, and we're expanding further. Starting up in Spain as well. Spain too, yeah. yeah. We're currently in the, in, in the middle of a recruitment, it, indeed, yes. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you, you found your sector actually, because in the 90s, if I'm correct, you when you started working, you were a marketing manager before, and yes. partly a consultant as well. Yes. Just like our previous guest, Mike, who started off being a consultant as well. Yeah. But ever since then, you've been in so many other spots because you were all also one of the director of Conne Connection, a giant company here in the Netherlands, responsible for mobility as well. But now, since a few years, you are the CEO of Transer and also being part of the supervisory board of Amber Mobility with the electrical car sharing, for example. So you really found your sector, I suppose. Yep, that's an understatement. Yep. What makes you this enthusiastic about mobility? Uh, what I really like about mobility, and I'm, I'm very curious also uh, for the other founders, is that it's the public-private angle. It's about societal relevance. It's about accessibility, livability. And that's what I really, that's what makes me tick. And if I'm active already for almost, uh, almost 25 years in this, in this sector, um, you always see it developing. And now, uh, recently, I moved from uh, a board position to uh, a, s a small startup scale-up. And it's really great to be part, uh, to have your feet in the mud and to build something again yeah. um, in order to keep cities moving. And that's what our uh, vision is. Yeah. yeah. So on, on my next question, what was your motivation to move from connection with, let's say, 5,000 people towards Trenzo with about 40 people? That's like being able to build again because you're all about scalability as well, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Scale up companies. Yeah, I like to scale. I like to build. Uh, I like to work with young people, work on new things in new environments, so which makes challenge me that I can learn. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also what's happened uh, two and a half years ago when I moved from big to small. Uh, too big again, I hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to make it big again, and you yes. did it a few times yes. before as well. Also yeah. with uh, Abelio, which was also sort of actually a startup it years and years ago. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We built it. Uh, it uh, Abelio is a is a large at this very moment a large operator of buses and trains in the UK and Germany, and we started with four people, uh, four young smart people, and we built it. When I left, it was about one and a half billion turnover business, and now it's it's bigger than NS here in Holland. So wow. it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, and the journey is very nice. So hey, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn new things. And then at that certain moment, it's, yeah, that gives a lot of energy. Yeah. yeah. If it goes well. Yeah. 
Well, many hats, because next to that you also have worked with the NS, like the Dutch railway stations, and still part of the supervisory board, or you were from a 9292. Yes. The other app, is that actually like, it's not really a colleague, is it? It's a, it's a client now these days of yeah. uh, Transfer, so we deliver ticketing to them, uh, and they have 3 million visitors and users every day, and we provide tickets to them. So it's... Uh, it, from a from a member of the supervisory board, they are now my one of my clients. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So within the field of mobility, you work in a fintech company with Transfer, yes. but next to that you have all these other hats and other positions and perspectives. So maybe that's very good for the people in the live stream as well to know that you have seen also upcoming startups from various angles. Because actually, yes. when you were part of Connection in the as a director, Transfer came by, and from Connection, you were one of the business angels. Can you tell us a little bit how that went? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Connection Transdev is the mother company. It's a French uh, global mobility uh, provider. And the business I, I was in was a business of doing large tenders on concessions. It's a concession-based business. And um, part of those, con of those bits, you had to differentiate you compared to competition. And those days, it's about five years ago, 2017, um, mobility as a service came up and was one of the evolving uh, topics and uh, we needed a solution for a certain tender in the Amsterdam area and um, we created um, a solution which became part of the bid. Um, we won and we had to deliver it and the company which I'm now working for initiated it together with us and we as a Connection invested in that company mm -hmm. to grow and here we are. So yeah. uh, that's the way it worked. So from angel investor uh, to now uh, one of the, of the board members. Yeah. yeah. And somewhere in, in this period, you thought, I want to be on that side of the table. Yeah, that's a long story. But okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, if you, I, I, I used to be on the board for a longer period. Uh, I've been a board member of, of Transdev in, in the Netherlands Connection for five years. And at a certain moment, you had, I was 50. It's one of those famous moments in your points in your in your life. Um, it was buying like, a Porsche <laughs> or going to a startup. No, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, as as the as the lady from Lightyear, I saw that uh, that 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 Mike. Uh, yeah. Mike, uh, I, I I listened to her, and what she said. Yes, I was one of those guys who set aside his package and went for the journey. And uh, cool. so that's what I did. And it's the freedom also to give to yourself that you develop yourself again by stepping back, stepping. Yeah, uh, and back means not down, but uh, take a different step in your life. And, uh, and I, I could afford it to do it. So. And was it a good choice? Yes, I, uh, I'm very happy at the moment. <laughs> it's, it's, it's again also a journey because you develop, your, you used to have a secretary, you used to, used to have your car as sometimes a driver to um, uh, booking your own hotel. That's, uh, that's, it, it sounds like very simple, but it's, <laughs> you had to, I had to get used to it. So, but I, it, I did it in a month, month or two, and then I was back. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really enjoy it. So cool. it's really cool. Yeah. But yeah. maybe also some downsides or challenging moments these last yeah. years. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's as you all experience, I think in the end, it's about a journey. You have, hey, you have a strategy and that strategy changes over time. Uh, you need funding. Uh, funding is also a journey again. Uh, you have to convince investors. Uh, so that's also part of the, uh, which is not always uh, roze geur en manen zijn. It's not always, what do you call it? Uh, uh, not always fairy tale stories. Fa no, it's not always fairy tale stories. So that's that's also part of the game. Yeah, but that's yeah. what I like. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Eric, in our preparation uh, talk, the conversation we had on the telephone, you said. Some components are very important for startup and also to make it able to, to scale. Uh, obviously the product or the service, yes. then the context in which it is embedded, and then team, which we spoke about with uh, Mike at the previous time as well. Yes. Um, maybe it's a good idea to ask the mobility founders who are in the call what their struggles are. And maybe it's on one of these three, or maybe it's on another component, because um, you said before you really want to zoom in on to scale, but then we need to know what their struggle is, isn't it? Yeah, let's do it. Shall, shall yeah. we ask them? So for the people in the live stream being here at this very time, if we talk about scalability within your own startup, within your, within your own company, what is the biggest hurdle you are facing right now? And maybe you can share it in the group and maybe Eric can help you. So who wants to give it a go? I'm happy to give it a go first. So I think one of uh, 
the big struggles is that as you're building a company that you that you balance between the longer term um, strategic vision and executing on that versus the very short term day to day struggles because basically I can spend 20 hours a day putting out fires and because everything is constantly going wrong and there's so much uh, yeah, operational stuff you can you can really uh, get into the weeds in. Um, yeah, and it's and it's sometimes really hard to think. Okay, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, I'm have to clear time to also think about the, the longer term stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm not sure if everyone and if anyone can relate, but that's what I find uh, quite um, yeah tough at times. I see some people smiling. Yeah, definitely, Eric. Yeah, I, I do recognize it. Sorry. Uh, yes, it's it's so recognizable, and I think this is one of the the key. The key things, I don't know how big your company is, how, with how many people you're working, if you're alone or with more people. Could you no, we're with 10 at the moment. 10. Yeah, what we, what we did at, uh, what we do at Transfer and did at Transfer is, uh, I always, and, and that's one of the things which I share, I always say, uh, please put some things on paper. Um, because if it's always in your head, it's sometimes difficult just to keep all the balls in the air, but also to, um, to, uh, to, to know what you're going to do and i think put it on paper share it with each other is something which helps um and always spend and, and and also that's what i do block time in your in your in your agenda to spend time on the medium and long term because i think it's extremely relevant to just to check once in a while am i doing the right things to to check with competition to check the market to check developments but also to validate what you had on paper whether it's still relevant mm-hmm. and i think uh, you always spend um, today is always more important than tomorrow uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an operational environment you're in. Um, but I think, and, and also that's also what we do, we're a bit bigger, we're uh, with about 40 people at the moment, is that some persons, we have roles uh, in the organization and also the medium and long term is a role of uh, one of us uh, and just to maintain it and just to challenge the organization and, the com- and, and colleagues whether we're still doing the right things. Uh, but it's it's doing things explicitly for yourself. I think it's an open door, maybe, but maintaining it's pretty difficult. I do. And then, that. and then, how often should you do such a thing? Like once a week, once a month, every three months? No, I, I think you don't have to do that too often. But uh, to, uh, to 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 as I put to put the thermometer in uh, in in the in the organization and in what you're doing, I think you do it. Uh, we have quarterly meetings uh, in the organization, so we have people around. Europe, so we have uh, we have offices in uh, in Berlin, in France, in Ber- Paris, in in Milan. So we then all people come also to the Netherlands, and that's one of those moments to re- revalidate the strategy, to revalidate market developments, and just to to uh, to, to align again. And that's one of those moments that you do what you describe, mm, uh, right. what you sometimes forget to do or don't have time to do. Yeah. To sharpen the saw. This is yeah, uh, that's ben- definitely true. Yeah. yeah, this is Bernice of uh, Bakme of the electric bikes for parcels. Actually, is there someone else facing a hurdle within their startup company, willing to share it with Eric? What are you facing in your journey towards a bigger company? You talked about funding. And um, sorry, I hope you can see me. It seems to be a bit dark here. Yes, we can see you, Mark. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you, you talked about funding, um, and I'm curious to understand um, some of your your journey, particularly if you're at the, uh, the pre pre revenue and early startup. I get a lot of lot of comments from any any uh, discussions I might have with investors to say you're too early. You're too early. Well, you know, I get that, but I need to get over that that hurdle, so I'm not too early. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's. Uh, I just was talking before this this session. I was talking to one of the directors here in the organization at the TU Eindhoven, the Technical Uni- University here, and that that's you're not the only one, as you know. Um, that that getting over that first hurdle is pretty difficult, and I think. Uh, I was one of those angel investors. Uh, I spent, uh, when I was uh, the CEO of, of Transef here, a uh, connection here in Holland, we invested a few hundred thousand euros in a new company because we believed in it. Uh, we, we needed it and we believed in it. Uh, uh, and that was a, yeah, a type of coincidence in a way. 
Um, but I think it's, it's, it's about networking, I think. And often the angel investors, I think if you look at the VC setting, uh, the venture capitalists, there are not that many who are really in the early, early stages, as you're referring to. Um, uh, and what you often hear and uh, what I also know, um, I'm also in, as, as, uh, as was said by Rudy, I'm also in the, in this, uh, in the supervisory board of a, of a car sharing company. They had, they started with a lot of families and friends and uh, direct relations yeah, to invest in, in the company. Uh, and, and that is something, um, something I don't have personally a lot of experience in with getting the money. I was giving the money, mm -hmm. um, so I know it from that perspective. Um, and that is about networking, I, I think, again, to make the analysis of who could be in, of interest to, to invest in your company. Uh, so and first, also the fools, friends, and family. But then, as you that's, said, that's what I've seen. So yeah. that's one one mean one way to but, get it. But then to uncover that a little bit more, Eric, you said I believed in them. What did you believe in that they would be valued at? No, that's about the team again. Eh? Yeah. It was also discussed uh, last time, previous time. I think the team, the person who leading it, his vision, his ambition but also um, the value proposition as such, eh, to have it well described uh, and know what it's all about, also compared to competition. That's uh, underpinned. Yeah, it's really underpinned. And also having a view and a, vi and a strategy how to roll it out. Because yeah. I think in the end, and that's about your uh, investment memorandum or your pitch deck, whatever you call it, I think it's extremely relevant that you have it validated, not only by yourself, but also maybe by some peers around you. Um, I think this program will also help, I think. It should help at least, uh, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, but uh, I think to have a good story, which is well uh, under underlined um, with people around you also, which are mitigating maybe your weaker spots, because in the end, you're not, Mr. Perfect doesn't exist and Mrs. Perfect neither. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also one of the things is, for us was team the most important thing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And actually, Eric, we touched upon this in the preparations as well on this very little subject is that sometimes you do not have the expertise or not have the like the blank mm -hmm. perspective from an outsider. And you said in the telephone call, sometimes you do have to hire expertise. You should be ready to pay for some advice. Yeah, yeah that's pretty double eh? because money is always the, the problem. Yeah. Um, it's the, the challenge at least. Eh? It's also referred to by, by the previous speaker. Um, I think that's that's something which uh, is not always difficult, not always easy. But if you are getting into a next stage and you're you need um, uh, you need money, uh, which is a bit bigger than a few hundred thousand euros, but uh, we're going into millions. Then often you get to a different type of yeah funder uh, type of funders which yeah. expect other type of investment memoranda and that kind of things. And then sometimes some support by an advisor, a corporate finance advisor could help. Yeah. But to be honest, I, if you can do it yourself, do it yourself. Because I think you have to tell the story anyway, uh, and they will only facilitate. They will yeah. challenge you with the, the, the investment memorandum. They will disclose their networks, which you don't have yourself, like VCs or strategic investors. Um, so they can help with that, but it's not... Uh, it's, 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 it's not the holy grail either. Yeah, yeah. So. and then the question came from Mark. He's from uh, Triple Trike, actually. No, Triple Tread, I have to say. An award-winning trike in the UK. You've got an international background as well, international expertise. Does it depend on the countries as well, as we have now members from the UK and France in the call and as well from the Netherlands? Mm -hmm. Can you say something like, in that country, it's easier because the ecosystem is... <coughs> or? Yeah. I no idea. It, it, it really depends on your product, of course, or yeah. your service. Mm -hmm. I think I cannot say gen something generic. The only thing I know is that the investment environment... But in maybe the momentum. Uh, in terms of? The oh, it, like you, you spoke about mass mobility as a service already five years ago. Is this something going on in the western part of Europe? Or are some countries really putting their eggs into that basket? Oh, if, if you look at my product and my service, yes, then I think the Netherlands was one of the, the most advanced countries in terms of mobility. Mm -hmm. I think also in distribution terms. Eh, I heard about the, 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 the Bakme. Uh, the Bakme uh, uh, the startup uh, the, company of Bernice. The startup yep. company. I think that's definitely in the Netherlands one of the things which are really appealing and there's a lot of demand for it. I know some. Uh, um, uh, one of our investors is Ponuk, 
Um, you probably know the Pond family who invests a lot in bikes and that kind of things. Um, I know that there is a lot of demand for that. Um, mobility as a service in the Netherlands is is advanced compared to, for example, UK yeah. or compared to uh, to Germany. Um, however, it really depends uh, market by market. Uh, yeah. it, it's really different. Yeah. I cannot say anything for the trikes. Uh, that's uh, that's for Another me too difficult. Yeah. Uh, I must be humble in that respect. Yeah. 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 All right. Other questions maybe from the members in the call for Eric? What do you want to ask him with all his expertise, with his network as well? Maybe he himself got some bags of money laying around. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. I, I have a quick question. I'm, it, Lee, it's um, you know, we. Uh, it seems like there's, of course, lots of public uh, money going into um, mobility as a service, right? From uh, from the EU and from the different governments. Um, is that helping or hurting a company like Transar? Are you getting? Uh, money? I mean, yeah. is, it, is it encouraging competition that shouldn't? You know, that maybe. You know, is, is it creating false competition for you or is it um, something that's actually uh, you're benefiting from also? I think it's a very good question, I must say. Um, I, I believe in subsidies for things which cannot thrive without. And that could be in very high tech stuff or uh, uh, things which really need the support at start. Uh, if you look at uh, photonics or whatever, then I can imagine that it's really requiring additional money. But if you look at my business, mobility as a service, I think the market, uh, it's a regulated market we're in, but I think the, mark, the private market can solve this. And I agree, so we don't have any subsidies, uh, none. So we do everything, by, we have a, the, 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 the business model should thrive on its own. Yes, we participated in certain tenders, uh, just to to get posi yeah, position in the market, but the, the 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 earning model itself should be able to run just on private income, private in terms of uh, we get some um, we we are being paid by transactions per transaction, and yes, public money in this respect from either Europe or the Dutch government or the French government. Um, is sometimes creating oh. um, a competition which is not fair. It's a non-level playing field as such. Uh, and I think that doesn't, that sometimes does hurt new initiatives. But I believe that if our model and our business is doing well, then we will survive that too. Uh, because we are, spe we, are, we are faster, we are more innovative. Money that doesn't always help, as you know, because it make, can make lazy. Uh, so uh, I'm a big believer of, uh, um, have uh, no, not too much money. Some healthy work yes. ethics. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Money can yes. be. Yeah. Okay. So also the false competition, they will maybe fall over again whenever the subsidies are. That, being that's lessened. what you often see. That's yeah. what you often see. Uh, things which start only with 100% subsidy, in the end, you it, the, the subsidy uh, stream is stopping at a certain moment. Yeah. So then, what's happening next? And then often it stops. Yeah. 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 Hey, Eric, a, a few years ago, these two uh, founders, Paul and Sonica, they knocked on your door whenever you were still working with Connection and you saw the potential and you made the switch and you went there. And now a few years later, you're starting these pilot projects and you said already before you're getting paid per ticketing, but then for public transportation last year or the previous year was disastrous, obviously. People were asked by the Dutch government, please do not use the trains, do not use mm -hmm. the buses, stay home, work from home, don't leave your house, while well, you are actually are waiting on many, 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 many numbers of people who are mobile, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, true. Yeah, it was not ideal timing. Um, How did you cope? Now, we, had, we were lucky, I must say. We were lucky guys and girls um, because we were building the business at that moment. So we're spending more money than we uh, were earning money. So, uh, and we were not expecting too much income those those first years. So um, that's what made it easier. So we only, ha only had to spend, um, which is uh, the, the funding was there. So we only had to spend the money to build the business, to build our position. Um, so in that respect, from a financial point of view, it, it hurt, but not too much. Yes, it delayed things, true, but not that we were like... Uh, um, Panicking. Uh, no, definitely not. 
Um, what it didn't help with is, of course, it was difficult to travel to potential clients, to operators. Uh, yeah. um, so it was more difficult to reach people and to uh, to interact and and to be present at events. Uh, ev- only digital doesn't work either. This is nice, but it's much better to sit uh, around the table to have a conversation. At least that's my my personal opinion. Yeah. So um, uh, so uh, yes, it didn't help. Uh, delayed a bit, but from a financial point of view, um, yeah, we managed. Yeah, uh, and yeah. we're still there. Yeah, so. you also touch upon a new pillar, actually, Eric, because you said in the with the three pillars having the product, the context, and the team. Another aspect which is highly important whenever you want to scale a biz- business, obviously, is network, yeah. and that's something you brought to Transer whenever you made the transition because you come in at sea level and you know all these stakeholders actually in this very regulated market. Um, did you also have a clear strategy on who to approach first or where to start? Like having the pilot projects that you just send out a message, we're ready for pilot projects, who's uh, willing to opt in? Or did you really go to several places? Yeah, and the pilot projects were, were very few, by the way. So it was not that it's that's our rollout model at all. No, but it was also, I was trying to be honest to uh, one of the, <laughs> the, per- the persons who posed the question regarding subsidies. Yeah. Um, but it was only a small part. Now, of course, in the end, if you got an ambition and you got targets to be delivered, then you need a rollout strategy. And the rollout strategy starts with a good analysis of your market, uh, competition, uh, but also the opportunities. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we, uh, it, it requires some homework. That's what we did. And uh, yeah, we identified the right parties to approach first. Uh, we did that together as a team. And then we tried to knock on the right doors uh, and to pull the right strings. Um, but in the end, your product should still be right. Yeah. Uh, so it's nice to have a network, but if the product sucks, then in the end, uh, they won't buy it anyway. Yeah. So, um, and, and as we, we didn't touch yet, um, and I don't know what, it's, what it is true for you uh, as, as, as founders, but we had to shape a market too. The market didn't really exist. So for us, it was also creating a demand which people were not aware that they needed it. Mm-hmm. So it was a, uh, yeah, what do you call it? Latent, uh, latent? I don't know what the, yeah, the it's, word is. It's somewhere it was, down It was somewhere service. down there, but uh, to create that market. And creating a market is really investing time and to tell a good story and to have a vision where you want to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where I also spent, together with the founders, a lot of time on to create that awareness uh, with people and with companies um, that they needed and how did you do so? Uh, having a good story, create a good story. Uh, have a really, uh, the, the, one of the founders, Paul, is really a visionary guy with an extreme amount of energy, um, which really helps because in the end, it's about sending, sending, and, yeah, and to absorb uh, the punches you get because people do not always like it. It seems um, that you're happy that you don't have to do that all the time. That no, he is no, I'm, that really, I, I'm really impressed by that because yeah, that cool. was one of the reasons why I moved. Yeah. Um, because I believed in his story and in his energy and also, also of Sonica is, is that they really were, were really powerful. Paul enchanted you as well with his way of delivering his story with yeah. his enthusiasm. And you were, were responding, that's very nice for many people, but not for all of them. So whenever you go within your network, sometimes you have to tone it down or... Yes, true, and because that's that's the yeah you need different types of leadership yeah. in order to get there and uh, to level with all these other people who are outside and, and yes. are a div- different yeah. position and so therefore we're pretty complementary in that respect so that that really helps yeah so yeah. yeah as a theme of three directors yeah and then there came a question from Alan in the live stream stream please go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, uh, Eric. Uh, thank you for the nice session so far. Um, I noticed uh, uh, on your profile, actually, that you have quite some international experience. You also have now offices in various countries. And I also know from uh, coaching this group that all startups actually are already uh, orientating on going international, like the shared mobility ones going to Germany. Um, uh, that's all necessary to scale. So could you maybe share some of your experience there and maybe some tips related to going abroad. Tips for going abroad. I think it starts with having a good home base first. I think proof before I, I, I learned, I personally learned that going abroad is adding at least one extra complexity to it because <laughs> it's a new culture. It's a country you don't know. 
So it's adding a lot. It, it's 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 it's, a, it, it's yeah. I think it's a, it's a it's a lot of extra complexity mm. which you add to it. So your home position should be strong. So you you have to cre have you have to have created some evidence that your product or service is working, yeah, and well. that people are willing to buy it, and that your performance is right. Uh, I think that's where it starts. And then if you go abroad, and and I think it's uh, as with everything. If you want to go abroad and you need local presence, uh, in our case, and I can give an example, um, we moved uh, to Germany, for example, um, which is cultural-wise really different from the Netherlands, despite the fact that we can talk to each other, but a lot of other things are different. So what we always do is to hire local people. Um, and we also, and I also learned, you better high, hire better than yourself because then you are able to make that next step. So we always go for the best um, and don't go for second best. Uh, and that means that um, we make an analysis of uh, by LinkedIn, which is much easier than, than a long time ago. So, and we really pinpoint to that specific person we want to have. And we're really going to convince and we're going to visit them and we're going to invite them to the Netherlands um, they are spending two, three days in the company before they even have to decide whatever they want to do. So we get to know them, they get to know us. And we, as part of our onboarding process, we also, um, we also um, uh, invite them uh, to make a business case. And that business case can be make, share with us how you will develop the market or if it's a HR person in the Netherlands, okay, how will you ensure that we will hire the right people? So we ask everybody, I had to do it myself, and it holds true for everybody we hire, developers, everything, make your case. And then based on that case, which will be presented to a selection of the team, um, we will make a decision, and that should be a unanimous voting. So if one person says, mm, I don't think so, then we won't hire. Uh, and then we, take, we pick the person. And I think it's extremely relevant if you hire somebody abroad because it's even more difficult because it's very difficult to understand if this person is right or wrong uh, is the experience relevant so you really need that so that hiring and onboarding process for us is is key yeah that's one of the things i learned uh, which is extremely relevant yeah. thank you excellent and i'm very curious for the motivation from some of these people who jumped on board what what makes them because they were in quite good positions before yeah. i reckon yeah, we hire. Yeah, we, we of course we hire people from straight from university, but we also hire people with 10, 15, 20 years experience because yep. we're in a regulated market. So we need a network, um, uh, and we convince them by the story that the way I uh, I onboarded yeah, um, yeah, yeah. a good story, uh, good energy, um, uh, taking people seriously, uh, but then also what is about about really high performance teams? It's about empowerment. It's about freedom. It's about personal involvement, uh, input. So we give people a lot of responsibility, but also freedom. Uh, and I think is people need to be willing to build something new. So we're also looking for that type of people. Um, uh, and that's so far so good. So we are really, we are really able to, uh, I'm pretty proud of, uh, about it. Excellent. Uh, that we are able to recruit the right people also in new countries for yeah, ourselves. Yeah, even if you just cross the nearest border. I once heard the story of this entrepreneur from the east of the Netherlands and he had an extra company bought in Belgium. But he said, I had to go there every week to dine with those people, That's to eat and to dine and to win confidence because otherwise there was no business possible. Uh, yeah, so people don't feel alone if they're in that country. So we invite people at least on a six week basis, come to the Netherlands, feel part of the team, and we visit people really on a same similar type of uh, frequency. Yeah. So people really feel uh, part of it. And of course, we have got our, our daily stand-ups and we've got our weekly meetings on the commercial, on, uh, on, uh, on all those type of topics. Yeah, yeah. So Online, obviously. it's extremely relevant, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. good one. There's a new question coming from Ricardo. Thank you. So my question is more about, well, I understand that your mission, if I'm not mistaken, is to make the process of paying for travel as easy as possible, right? And then I wonder, because here in the UK, the reality to pay for travel is that you tap your bank card. So then my question would be that if your mission is indeed to make this process of paying for travel as easy as possible, if uh, 
expanding what you do to be able to operate this kind of systems that they just deal with the cards directly on the barriers. If this is something that you would consider to jump into, or the idea is to remain as like a API provider to handle all the financial side. Oh, I think it's a, you're very deep into my, uh, my business, I must say, I'm impressed. Um, um, uh, so, uh, yes, this is our business, what you described. So we don't, so we facilitate that other apps are able to do what you des describe. So you, you, you were de referring to the EMV technology in that respect, uh, to tap into about in London, for example, you can do with your bank card. Eh? We, everybody also from any country can just tap into about and then it's taken from your bank account. What we add to it is that that's not everywhere. That's in London. But if you take the train to, uh, to you from Houston to, uh, for example, Glasgow, then you cannot do it anymore. So what we do is, yes, we facilitate that, but we also make it possible that you take the train and use a barcode to travel to Glasgow. And I think what we do is we integrate all those different systems which are there, and EMV is definitely one of those in, in, in for example, London, to connect it to other means. And we create one ecosystem. And this technology development and the earning model attached to it, that's what is our challenge. And that's what we are really developing and differentiate ourselves compared to banks, for example, and other uh, and other intermediaries in that particular case, yeah. The research part might have an overlap with you, Ricardo, isn't it? With Urbex? Yes, uh, uh, I'm not sure, what do you mean? Yeah, Sorry for the noisy surroundings. As you are learning from urban interventions as well, that's what you focus on with Urbex, isn't it? You want to see how people yeah, travel yeah. and if they, if they overlap or they cross from one mode of mobility. I mean, this for sure is a formidable source of data uh, yes. in an organized way to use these in the best way to do planning better, right? So for sure is a very valuable uh, layer to have, yeah. Yeah, and I think what in, in addition to that, I think the earlier you know how people will travel, so by planning, so earlier in the stage of decision making, I think it becomes even more interesting because then you can adapt your uh, routing or your, I don't know what exactly you do, but uh, the more uh, predictive you become, the more interesting it is. And that's also definitely one of the developments we're into, is to share those data and to develop, to create more value out of that. So that's also one of the things we're not doing a lot with yet, but it's definitely one of those developments uh, where, yeah, where, where value is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sweet. Interesting. Yeah. We're nearly done uh, mm -hmm. having a look at my, at my watch at the time. Um, yeah, some takeaways. What I, what I can see already is that it's really about building a solid foundation whenever you go international or whatsoever, or whenever you go and talk with partners who are, might be able to finance you or to collaborate with you, that you really have a strong position. What else do you want to give to the people of the mobility uh, startups, of the founders and people who are yeah. willing to scale as well? Uh, I think it's, it's create around you some um, some, some peers, create um, a group with peers who are really challenging you. Because I think in the end, it's about keeping yourself sharp. And I think it's also one of the things which were mentioned uh, at the start is, okay, stick to my strategy, uh, uh, look, look ahead, is uh, fine tune all the time because your strategy will not stay the same for sure. We change over time a lot. But as long as you take your whole team with you because you're creating something new and creating something new is extremely difficult and to put it into a market where a lot of other marketplaces, other market players are. And I think that's definitely one of the things which are extremely relevant. Find people around you, either in advisory boards or people in your team, even better, because then you see them on a regular basis. Find people who are complementary to you and are, willing, and, and, you are, and are able to really challenge you. Don't be arrogant. Really be humble and receptive for feedback. And that's, that's pretty difficult if you are the boss of the, of the gang uh, and, uh, and be open for it. I think that's one, I think one of the major things, I think, which Sweet. will really help you. Yeah, excellent. Well, Eric, thank you so much for visiting us here within the studio in Eindhoven at the University of Technology, as well for all the people in the live stream, definitely. So Eric has all these positions and also another thing that I take away from 
even if you are in a very comfortable business position, you are so you can be grasped by the energy of some other people like, that you still Definitely. make. And, and that's maybe also a lesson for the people of the mobility startups that, that they can ask for people who are venture capitalists or business owners or whatsoever. It's just, it has nothing to do with age or position. If they believe in you, yeah. they still want to be part of the team yeah. or invest in you or help you. Yeah, don't be humble in that respect. In that case, don't. In the previous one, do. Yes, in that respect, just be convinced about your own story and to, to invite people whether they want to join you even senior if they are in different positions you think oh they will never move people are willing to move yeah really for the good story and the good energy and the freedom i'm i'm really i, I know a lot of people who have done it so yeah. excellent dear all this was the online interview the booth interview with coo of transer erik van eindhoven the second one in uh, in a row of many more and the mobility startups were in the call and they were yeah they were were in the position to actually ask some questions thank you so much once again for joining us and to all the mobility startups on the other side of the line good luck with your businesses and hopefully next year they will be much much bigger than they are today see you next time <laughs>